Hey Optimancers, Chris here. I've been compiling a series where I rank every subclass in the game, and these are the rankings so far. Now, in previous weeks, there have been some errors in the slides. This one should be correct. It's kind of a long story, and I'm not going to get into it, but I just want to let you know that I've also got links to corrected slides for every video I've done up to now in the video description, as well as this one if you want to see it bigger. Uh, so if you want to look at the video description, you can find links to all those slides. And here we are. It was bound to happen. We're talking about monks. For those who aren't aware, I have publicly and repeatedly expressed my opinion that I consider monks the class with the least mechanical potential of any class in the game, at least optimization-wise. I think, you know, if you're playing in a non-optimized game and people are Maybe they're not taking feats. Their fighter is just swinging a longsword, using strength and, the, you know, raising their constitution with their ASIs. Then, you know, a monk does okay. But as soon as somebody really knows what they're doing in terms of accessing the right options to make the most out of their features, monks just get less or they have less options. And that's what makes them weaker. But that doesn't mean that every monk is weaker than every other subclass of every other class. So let's take a closer look. If you'd like to support this content, consider supporting me through Patreon. There is a link in the video description, and patrons of this channel can look at these videos early and non-monetized, and top-level patrons meet me for some D&D every month. Today I want to recognize these top-level patrons. Cass Byrne, Christian Windham, Unknown Watcher, Craig Locklear, Dank Train, Dash Panther, Dave Peters, David F., David Oliveira, and David W. Skivens. Thank you all so much for your support. Let's get started. First, let's discuss how the ranking system is going to work. Now, you, if you've seen this part in previous videos, just go to the timeline. You'll find the next segment bookmarked, so you can just jump right ahead. So here is how it will work. I will not be discussing any subclass that is not official content. So subclasses that are third-party or playtest material are not included. This is a power ranking, so I'm not taking into account how well they are designed in this ranking or my personal preference. This will take into account how powerful they are as a single class build, as well as how powerful they are when multi-classed. I will be assuming feats are allowed and used, and that all the optional class features in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything are allowed as well. Just some things to note as well. Features are weighted by how soon they are received. A feature you get at level 3 is much more valuable than a feature you get at level 10, because these features see way more gameplay when you actually play the subclass. So this is not a comparison of which of these subclasses are more powerful at 20th level. I don't think that's very relevant to players. This is a comparison as to which you will find most powerful, assuming you are starting at low level and advancing levels through gameplay. A feature you have for 100% of that time is five times more valuable than a feature you're going to have for 20%. And although I will consider all three pillars of gameplay, I will be weighing the combat tier most heavily. The combat tier tends to be the tier that is most reliant on mechanics, and mechanics is what I'm looking at here. I also assume you will not be playing as a solo character. So features that work well with teammates, or even better, improve your teammates, will be considered in the ranking. Now before we begin, I'm going to address a couple common misconceptions before they come up. A bad feature does not make a subclass less powerful. I can add 10 terrible and practically useless features to the most powerful subclasses and they're still the most powerful. I'm only looking at features that make a subclass better. Secondly, just because a feature can be replicated with a feat does not mean the feature isn't good. Feats are not free and they can be very powerful. They can even be more powerful than a subclass feature. So, a feature that can be replicated by a good feat can still be a great feature, improving the power level of the subclass. And the person playing that subclass has one extra feat they can use 
on any of the many potent feats in the game, I guarantee you're not going to have enough feats, and having one more is a big benefit. These rankings, of course, are subjective, and I don't expect anyone to agree with them in their entirety. And I do have some personal biases, which will probably become apparent. I like spells. I think they can be very powerful. And that's going to be clear enough as we move forward. Also, I should say, I like to make my saving throws, and I don't care who knows it. Give me a way to do that more reliably, and I'm likely to consider a subclass more powerful because of it. Finally, I don't assume you will be limited to one encounter per day. I don't assume you will have short rests whenever you want. So features that can be used more often, I consider to be more powerful than single use ones. Now, this is a very common rating system in D&D for the ranking of classes and subclasses, and it includes anywhere from the S tier being the highest and the D tier being the lowest, and I will not be using it. Instead, I'll be using this expanded tier chart that includes an E and F tier. Here are the criteria I will be ranking the subclasses with. If I give a subclass an S tier ranking, I don't just think it's powerful. I think it's probably too powerful. I think there are some potentially game-breaking mechanics involved, and these are going to come into play without requiring high-level play at all. My issue with these subclasses is you have a real possibility of invalidating other player character features. This can lead to overshadowing other players, and so if you're a power gamer, these options are for you. If you aren't, I think I would think carefully before selecting an S-tier subclass. If I give a subclass an A-tier ranking, I think it's a very powerful option. Characters using an A tier subclass are easy to optimize and have features that should be showstoppers in gameplay, stomping down challenges with abandon. We may not break the game, but we're definitely going to make it a fair bit easier. If I give a subclass a B tier ranking, I think it's a good subclass. Optimizing a B tier subclass should result in a very effective character that has a strong contribution to a party of characters. Even with limited optimization, a B-tier subclass is probably still going to be reasonably effective. If I give a subclass a C-tier ranking, I think it's a decent option. Optimizing a C-tier subclass may require a bit more thought about how to make the best use of the features, but they can still be quite effective if handled with some thought and consideration. If I give a subclass a D-tier ranking, I think it's serviceable. Optimizing a D-tier rank subclass will lead to a decent character that can usually still pull their weight, but I wouldn't expect to stand out. If I give a subclass an E-tier ranking, I think it's a weaker option. An E-tier subclass needs some extra effort to make a character that contributes effectively at all, or perhaps the contributions they make end up being extremely narrow or rely heavily on other characters helping them out. It's still possible to make a character that can be somewhat effective with an E-tier subclass, but if you just play it as it's presented, you can probably expect a disappointing experience. If I give a subclass an F-tier ranking, I think it's basically unredeemable. An F-tier ranked subclass differentiates from an E-tier subclass because it is bound to disappoint and there just aren't any good ways to optimize it to make it worthwhile. And the F tier subclasses, along with the S tier subclasses, I think can be a problem when considering a team of players because they create pretty overwhelming imbalance. Subclasses aren't balanced against each other, and that's normally okay. But when you have these extreme cases on either end, it can weaken the game. When subclasses receive the same rank, I will be placing subclasses I think are more potent, more to the left of the chart, with the weaker further to the right. So at the end of this series, I will have a comprehensive list from top to bottom of every class and subclass combination in the game, all 114 of them. Ah, uh, so monks, where do I begin? I guess at the beginning. First, our class features include a d8 hit points, which is middle of the road, no armor proficiency, this is the only non-caster in the game without an armor proficiency. And don't give me an armored defense. Barbarians have unarmored defense, and they still get armor proficiencies that they could use if they wanted to. Monks don't. 
we get simple weapon and short sword proficiencies for saving throws, dexterity and strength, and the standard two skill proficiencies with six options. At first level, we get unarmored defense, which means our armor class is going to be 10 plus our dexterity and wisdom modifiers. This usually means around a 16 armor class, which isn't terrible to be honest, but it is not strong. Being forced into this means we're never going to benefit from anything like magical armor either. You can eventually get your armor class up to 20 through this, as long as you don't want feats or anything. So our monk obviously needs an armor defense, but it's probably just worse than if they could wear armor. We also get martial arts, which does a few things. First, they make sure you aren't accessing armor through any means by restricting this to monks that aren't wearing armor. Our weapon use is also restricted in order to benefit from this. Though it is less restricted than it used to be, basically we're not able to use this feature with weapons with a special or heavy properties. This was more limited before Tasha's, and technically now we're limited to one weapon at a time that didn't qualify before, but that's really not a big deal. But as long as we're using a qualifying weapon, we can use our dexterity instead of our strength for attack rolls and damage, and when you take an attack action with that weapon, you can make a bonus action attack with an unarmed strike. We can also use the monk weapon damage die instead of the normal damage die in our unarmed strikes and monk weapons. This is not a good feature. The die is a d4, so we can swing our longsword for d10 damage, or by accessing our martial arts feature, we could use a d4 instead. But it does scale, so eventually, and I mean at high levels, you could replace that longsword d10 with a d10. Even if you're using a weapon with lower damage die, like a hand crossbow, then you still have to wait until level 11 until you would see any benefit from this at all. And even then, it's really marginal. So the only really substantial benefit of the martial arts die at all is making sure at least our unarmed strikes do some damage. But a d4 plus dexterity, it's not a lot. Perhaps the biggest problem with martial arts is this is all a monk gets at first level, unless you consider the prohibition against wearing armor a feature, and to make use of this feature, we are forced into melee. This is with a class that can't wear armor, doesn't have a strong armor class, and doesn't have a lot of hit points. Oh, and can't take advantage of the Great Weapon Master feat since they can't use heavy weapons, so we can be certain our attacks will never deliver much damage. At second level, we get our key feature. This gives us two key points that we can spend, and they're recovered on a short rest. At second level, we have three options to spend this key. First, we can spend it to get two unarmed strikes as a bonus action. Like with martial arts, this requires we use the attack action first. Now, this isn't two extra attacks. This means instead of the bonus action on armed strike that we were getting for free through martial arts, we get one additional on armed strike for one key point. So, one key, and we're probably looking at you know, about six additional points of damage if we hit. Probably about four points of damage on average if we take our chance to hit into account. So, if we use up our key exclusively on this, we can probably do about eight points more damage per short rest, total. Secondly, we can use a key to take a dodge action as a bonus action. Remember that our martial arts attack uses a bonus action, so if we use this, we lose an attack in addition to having to spend the key. But I will say, this does really boost our defense by a lot. But it is just twice per short rest, at least at level two. And if we do that, then we're not doing anything else with our key and we're going to have trouble doing anything with much impact since we're not using martial arts bonus action attacks on the rounds we use this. Finally, we can use key to disengage or dash with our bonus action. So it should be apparent just how painful bonus actions are for monks. We have a free feature that provides a bonus action attack at level 1, but to do any of these things, we have to give that up, and these all require a key. A rogue, by the way, can disengage or dash using their bonus action all day long. They can hide with a bonus action too, but the poor monk is forced to spend key to do the same thing. It doesn't really make sense. I mean, these classes got these features at the same level, and rogues get to do theirs with no resource, and monks have to use their only resource, and then it's gone in a flash. 
We also get unarmored movement, which increases our speed by 10 feet, and this does increase, but not that quickly. Level 6, we get an additional 5 feet of movement. We also, at higher levels, can do interesting things like run up walls and that kind of thing. Now, my main problem with this feature isn't that movement speed isn't useful. Movement can be really useful. But in the case of monks at level 2, we're really talking about getting in position to deliver damage that we can't really improve with feats, and that's a big problem. If monks could just use heavy weapons, and use those weapons with their martial arts attack as well, this movement speed would be huge. But since our attacks are basically forced to be on the lower spectrum for damage, it really isn't all that big a deal if we can't attack because we're too slow, since the damage isn't all that impressive to begin with. And to be clear, a monk at level 2, subpar damage is really all they can do. We get our subclass at level 3, and we'll get at least one feature right away. Then we get another at level 6, 11, and 17. My general assumption is that most campaigns are done by level 12. So just like with the other classes, I won't be discussing the super high level feature, as it's probably going to carry virtually no weight in the rankings. The level 11 features I will discuss though, but I am assuming that they will be available for a very small portion of the campaign, so I'm weighting them that way. We can also deflect missiles at level 3, so we use our reaction, and then we can reduce the damage of a missile, very possibly to zero damage. The problem with this, like many similar abilities, is that the reaction blocks only one attack. Of course, this has the added and pretty significant issue of only working with missiles. Finally, at level 3, we get Key Fueled Attack, and that's through Tasha's optional class features. That allows you to make a bonus action attack with an unarmed strike or a monk weapon when we spend at least one key point with our action. This is obviously quite limited because our key is limited, and most of the time, we can make an unarmed strike as a bonus action anyways. But this does provide two actually tangible benefits. The first is, if you don't attack with your action, but do something else that requires key, and get ready for that, because everything is constant key with this class, then you can make a bonus action attack. The second is that you can actually attack with a weapon, not just the unarmed strike, and a weapon is almost always going to be better than unarmed strike, even with the limitations on monk weapons, the inability to use Great Weapon Master, we're still probably just doing more damage with a weapon. Never mind bonuses to hit we might have, because that weapon might actually be magical. At 4th level, we can use our reaction to reduce falling damage, and that's okay, I guess. I don't see it coming up all that often. We can also use, you guessed it, key points to regain hit points. This is just a rip-off. One martial arts die plus proficiency bonus of hit points, that's going to be about 4 or 5 points when we get this, and it's never going to be much. And we have to spend two key to get this. Two key! What is going on? At level five, we get extra attack. And to be blunt, this is the first good feature the monk actually gets. Extra attack is legitimately a good feature. The problem here is our earlier features are basically forcing us into melee without a heavy weapon. So this extra attack isn't going to benefit from great weapon master either. I mean, you could just screw being a monk, I guess, and grab a heavy weapon anyways, use your extra attack properly, but then why not just be any of the many other classes with extra attack where their class features aren't invalidated by using a weapon that can be hard hitting through feats. I will say in Tash's, the Crusher feat does look like a feat you could actually use with the monk and get some reasonable value of, but it's not boosting your damage very much. It's really just a way of getting a little bit of control in addition to your attacks. And we also get Stunning Strike at level 5. Players who love monks love Stunning Strike. And I will admit, Stunning Strike isn't terrible. I know I use hyperbole sometimes, but Stunning Strike isn't a bad feature. I won't admit it's a strong feature for level 5 though. Stunning Strike has a lot of problems. The first and most obvious is, it's feeding off the very same limited resource pool as all our other features. And what the f*** is up with that? Sorcerers don't have to use sorcery points to cast spells, barbarians don't have to expand rage to reckless attack, rogues don't have to expand resources at all for their features, monks are unique, 
but unique in a terrible way in that they have one really limited and slowly scaling resource that feeds every limited feature they have. And features from their subclass as well, by the way. They're going to feed off the same resource. Monks on paper have key, but in play, they just don't have key for long. Stunning Strike requires you dip into the same resource. The second problem with Stunning Strike is it provides a saving throw, and that saving throw is the absolute worst saving throw it could provide. Constitution. On average, Constitution is the highest saving throw that your enemies are going to have. The third problem with Stunning Strike, and this is probably the biggest one, is simply it never gets better. Spells improve with levels. Paladin Smite harder. Rogue Sneak Attack harder. Bard Inspiration Dice Scale. But the poor monk gets this feature at level 5, and they are relying on it for the rest of the campaign. Of course, a very limited number of times per short rest, and in doing so, prevent using other class features because it's from the same resource pool, and it never improves. I mean, I guess it does improve the same way a first level spell might improve, in that we are getting the effect on a more powerful target as we level up, but it's still just a first level spell. Or in the case of a monk, it's still just the same stunning strike we got at level 5. Now our DC can go up and, oh, we should talk about that too, because they decide to set the DC on this for wisdom, not dexterity. So unlike, you know, a battle master that can improve their DC just by increasing the ability score they were going to increase anyways, the monk has to choose. Do they want to keep up with the hit rolls, or do they want to keep up with DCs? That said, if you hit an enemy with an attack, expend the resource, and the enemy makes their saving throw, nothing happens. But if they fail their saving throw, then they're stunned for a round. And if this works, that is pretty good. A stunned creature is just really screwed. Now the duration is nothing to write home about one round, but you know what? One round can make a big difference. And for that reason, I do think, honestly, Stunning Strike is okay. I don't agree with the love I see for the feature. People who choose this class for this feature, I think, are making a mistake. I mean, it really is like having, like, maybe a first level spell that you can cast a few times per short rest, but it's one spell, it's first level, and it never gets better. Because in power level, Stunning Strike is very similar to what we would expect from a first level spell. Now people will say, but you can use Stunning Strike more than once around, and you can't do that with spells. And sure, but again, you've got this limited key supply. So you're still not getting a whole lot of Stunning Strikes per short rest. You can lump them all together, but in the end, you're not getting any more of them than you'd be getting if you could only use one per round. Finally, at level 5, we can spend... Oh, you know what's coming. More key. Because we have an endless supply, apparently. You and I know it's one key point per level of monk. But the designers don't seem to realize this because everything costs key. And now we're talking about even more. Because we can spend one to three key points to increase our attack roll by two for each key point spent. This would be such a great feature. But where the hell is all this key coming from? At level 6, our unarmed strikes are treated as magical. Obviously, this is necessary, because we now have to talk about another problem with the monk chassis. Throughout our career, a significant portion of our attacks are going to be with unarmed strikes. And that means we're not just out of luck when it comes to magic armor, but we can't take full advantage of magic weapons either. I mean, a monk could still use a magic spear, but that doesn't help with their unarmed strikes. Consider it this way. Let's say you're in a party and you find a magic spear. Do we give it to the fighter who makes bonus action spear attacks, or to the monk who makes bonus action unarmed strikes? The monk is just getting less from that magic weapon. At level 7, we get evasion. That lowers the damage from area of effects that normally give a dexterity save to take half damage. This is not a bad feature. But I will point out that a lot of these kinds of effects require constitution saves, and this does nothing for those. But, you know what, dexterity area of effects do happen some of the time, and for them, this is good to have. We also get stillness of mind, which allows us to end an effect that caused you to be charmed or frightened using your action. And this one blows. Charmed and frightened absolutely do happen. 
and a feature that protects you from those is normally something I like. But usually they don't take your turn away from you. And also, there's a lot of Frightened or Charm effects where you don't get to choose what to do with your action. So let's say for some reason the enemy mage decided to cast Dominate Person on you, the monk, for some reason. Maybe they mistook you for a spellcaster because you weren't wearing armor. So you can't end that with this because you don't get to decide to use your action to end that. So this really sucks because it's often not protecting you at all from the things it is supposed to protect you from. But even when it does, it still steals your action on your turn from you. At level 10, you're immune to disease and poison. Disease really isn't a common problem in D&D, but immunity to poison is legitimately a good feature. And so here's the point where your campaign is probably over. You're probably playing levels 1 to 10 or maybe levels 1 to 12, and then we're done. But do you notice anything missing? Weren't monks supposed to be great at saving throws? Well, we could have become pretty good at saving throws had the campaign went to level 14. Saying monks are good at saving throws is like saying rangers turn invisible. It's technically true eventually, but at most tables it's just not the case. So that's our chassis. It's a non-caster, like no spells. They can't use heavy weapons, so no great weapon master. Their bonus action is definitely not available, so no polar master. Their features require they're in melee, so no sharpshooter or crossbow expert. I mean, I guess you could take crossbow expert and then go into melee, but our armor class is kind of reliant on us not taking feats, so there's that too. And then there's stunning strike, which is about as good as a first level spell. And like spells, it's fueled off a limited resource. But unlike spells, that resource fuels everything else the class can do. And Stunning Strike is about as good as a first level spell at level 5. And it's about as good as a first level spell at level 20. When it comes to multiclassing, monks are probably actually the worst class for multiclassing in the game. Because they are the class that imposes a bunch of restrictions that carry over to your multiclass as well. As soon as you take a level of monk, you have to give up armor, shields, heavy weapons. Most classes only add things when you multiclass into them. Taking away things is fairly unique to monks. Druids technically can carry restrictions for multiclassing as well, but nothing like the monk does. Now, uh, I guess you could just ignore the restrictions, but then you give up the benefits of multiclassing monks. So it's either giving you nothing or it's giving you some benefits and then taking away other options. Now, if you are primarily monk and then you dip into something else, that can be okay. It should be no surprise that I'm saying this, but Monk is the worst chassis in the game. And it's not even that all their features are bad. They have some decent features, but they are forced out of their armor, they're forced into melee, they're forced to use a non-heavy weapon, they're forced to spend a super limited resource to use half of what they get. So the Monk needs just a great subclass more than any other class in the game. Well, they have 10 choices. First up, Way of Mercy. This one was introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. At third level, we get three features. So, three features, not bad. Implements of Mercy gives us two skill proficiencies and wisdom-based skills and a tool proficiency. So, as always, skill proficiencies are okay. Then we get Hand of Healing. We can use an action to heal someone for our martial arts style plus our wisdom modifier. This costs one key point, so it's probably half the cost of Quickened Healing and it can be used on others. The nice thing here is we can use it to replace one of our unarmed strikes with Flurry of Blows, and then it doesn't cost anything beyond the cost of Flurry of Blows in the first place. So this is kind of a no-brainer. Of course you should do this. So you can use your action and one key, or you can use your bonus action, one key, and make one unarmed strike as well. So this feature is pretty good actually. Assuming we're using Flurry of Blows anyways, then this just gives us a healing option in exchange for one of the unarmed strikes. Nothing wrong with that. Giving up an unarmed strike is no big deal, as long as we're getting some kind of decent benefit. And the final thing we get at third level is Hands of Harm. When we hit a creature with an unarmed strike, we can spend a key point to do necrotic damage equal to our martial arts die plus our wisdom modifier, and we can do this once per turn. So this one will definitely drain key. But when we take the attack action and we're looking to inflict extra damage but don't want to spend multiple key points, 
we could either flurry of blows or we could use our martial arts attack and then apply this to it. This is the better of those two options because number one, we only spend the key if the attack hits. And if we do spend the key, then we're automatically doing the damage. In the case of flurry blows, spending the key is a gamble and may inflict a similar amount of damage to this or it may do nothing. So I think this is definitely better than flurry of blows. Now you can do both, but if you do, you are spending a lot of key really fast. And again, you just don't have it. The key is gonna go fast. So I think Mercy does okay at level three. Hands of Healing is pretty good. Hands of Harm is okay. At level six, we get Physician's Touch, which is really just improvements for both Hands of Healing and Hands of Harm. Our Hands of Healing now removes a condition. Of course, this is only a benefit if the recipient is suffering one of the applicable conditions of blinded, deafened, paralyzed, poisoned, or stunned. Now, if an ally is suffering any of these conditions, maybe with the exception of deafened, depending, then this alone is going to be well worth the unarmed strike from the flurry, never mind the fact that you get the healing on top of it. This is actually one of the only ways to remove the stunned condition in the game, but removing paralysis, blinded, poisoned is still going to be huge if it comes up. Most rounds, you're not going to get any use of that, but when you need it, it's going to be very good. Our Hands of Harm now delivers the poison condition until the end of our next turn. Lots of creatures in the game are immune to poison. But you know what? Even more aren't. And this is taking a feature like Hands of Harm that was okay, and it makes it fantastic. So applying a debuffing condition with no saving throw, plus we do some damage, that is fantastic. If this was a spell, you would get a saving throw, guaranteed. Probably you would take half damage and no condition on a successful save. Here, we use it, and unless they're immune, which, honestly, we probably know beforehand. Like, we know this isn't working on fiends or undead already. But as long as they're not immune, this just works, guaranteed. And that really is something. So Physician's Touch is really notable. The Hands of Healing Boost is really circumstantial, but it could be a lifesaver in those circumstances. And the Hands of Harm boost is going to be fantastic in probably more than half your fights. And that is really something. When I said a monk really needed the subclass to deliver, this is what I meant. Also, I'm not going to be saying this often. Here we have two great options and neither require us to spend extra key. It's almost surprising. No, no, it really is surprising to see that the Mercy Monk isn't forced to spend extra key to have their Hands of Healing remove a condition and have their Hands of Harm impose one. Honestly, in the average Monk subclass, we would expect the Monk to have to spend extra key and then the target would make a saving throw or then be poisoned for a round. So this feature really is abnormal for standard Monk feature design in a good way. Now we still have the problem that in a significant amount of fights, we're not going to be able to use our Hand of Harm effectively. And that's just the way it is. Then at level 11, Flurry of Healing and Harm scales our Hands of Healing and Harm again. So with Hands of Healing, basically we can do it twice with one Flurry of Blows. So one key point, two heals. What I find funny about this is if you do want to heal outside of combat, Using the Flurry of Blows healing is more efficient than just doing the action for your Hands of Healing. But we can only use Flurry of Blows after taking the attack action. So you want to heal outside of combat? Well, we have to punch something, like we punch the wall. Oh, take that wall. Okay, have some healing. And with our Hands of Harm, we can now replace a Flurry of Blows attack with Hands of Harm, and it doesn't cost any additional key. I noticed they did this at the same time they had Hands of Healing use up both our Flurry and Arm Strikes. So we basically can choose between Hands of Harm or Hands of Healing when we Flurry, but we still can't do both. Well, I guess we sort of can, because you could still do one Hands of Healing and one Hands of Harm, but you give up on the double healing that way. And the designers forgot something important here, because they forgot to make these cost a bunch more key. So Mercy Monk is basically two features, Hands of Healing and Hands of Harm. Both of them are okay at third level, but they become a lot better at level six, and they continue to get better from there. 
and particularly in the case of Hands of Harm. With Mercy, you're just eventually going to be spending all your key on Flurry of Blows, and then we spam Harm and Healing with no additional key expenditure at all. So we have here a Monk subclass that doesn't drain all our key, and that is so refreshing. Not that these features are free, though, because if you Flurry, you are spending key, and once you run out, then you really aren't getting much more from this subclass. So let's keep that in mind before we get carried away. I have played Mercy Monk, and I have to say, it was okay. Defensively, it is still a monk, and that's not good. But offensively, it's delivering a condition with no saving throw, and that's not monk-like at all. The damage is still pretty so-so. But if we're reliably imposing conditions, then we can get by with so-so damage. So the Mercy Monk is still built on the weaker Monk chassis, and that provides some pretty hefty limitations. Could you imagine if a Bard could impose the Poison Condition on an enemy with no save when they handed out inspiration to their allies? That would be crazy! But in the case of Monk, it takes a terrible class and it makes it okay. That doesn't mean it's easy though. It's not. You can still really burn your key absolutely immediately. But to be effective here, we have to learn to conserve it and use it carefully and thoughtfully. So this isn't an easy class to work well, but if you work it right, it does okay. So this is a D. You can make a decent character through Mercy Monk, but this involves some very careful decision making. D ranking isn't bad. D ranking means you can make a decent character, you have to do some right decisions, and you probably aren't going to stand out a huge amount, but you can certainly contribute. So D is not a condemnation here. Mercy Monk is perfectly fine. I have no problem recommending it. But I'm not going to suggest it as one of the more powerful subclasses. The next Monk subclass is the Way of Shadow. This subclass is from the Player's Handbook, and honestly, was probably the best Monk from that book. Or, maybe I should say, the least worst? At level 3, we get one feature, Shadow Arts. This provides us a free cantrip, so that's okay. It's a good cantrip too. Then we can cast 4 spells, except we don't get spell slots. We have to use key, of course we do! And it's 2 key each. The spells are Darkness, Dark Vision, Pass Without Trace, and Silence. These are all 2nd level spells. Now they could have done some really cool things here. Like, what if the Shadow Monk had been able to see through the darkness they create? You know, like a Shadow Sorcerer can do at the same level, but you can't. Still though, it is four spells, and none of them are terrible, and Pass Without Trace is actually really good. Three out of four of them require concentration, and, and that's another thing. Maybe the Monk shouldn't have to have needed concentration, because they definitely don't have Warcaster, they're not proficient in constitution saves, they can't really afford to protect their concentration like a spellcaster can. So I think there's an opportunity lost there. So we are getting second level spells on a third level character. And the there's four of them. And none of them are bad. One of them's pretty good. So that sounds pretty good. Here's why this isn't actually a good feature. Because if you got this on any other class in the game, they wouldn't say, well, Rogue, you can cast Silence. But if you do so, you don't get to sneak attack. And that's what's happening here. Because this is the only class in the game that can get spells and no resource to cast them. They do not give you a resource to cast them. Instead, you have to give up your snake strikes, you have to give up your flurry of blows, you have to give up your patient defenses, and not just one of them, you have to give up two of them to cast one of these spells. So they're making sure that they take away from you. You have to give something up in order to cast these spells. That's how monks are designed in this game. It's stupid. Then we get to level 6 and we get Shadow Step. This allows us to use a bonus action to teleport from dim light or darkness into other areas of dim light or darkness and we get advantage on one attack afterwards if it's on the same turn. I've played in campaigns with players playing Shadow Monks many different players, different tables, different groups and the questions are always the same. Hey, can I uh, maybe teleport under the chair. Maybe the chair is casting a shadow and maybe I can teleport there. What direction is the light coming from? Maybe somebody's casting a shadow and then I can teleport behind them. Because the thing is, is that a lot of times there is no set dim light in a combat. 
And so then the monk can't use the feature unless they can find some way around it. Of course, if you're in a room and there's like wall sconces around, it doesn't really matter, right? Because there's not going to be anywhere that's going to be dim light. And that's disappointing, of course, for a monk. So sometimes DMs are nice and they, you know, make something up. Oh, yeah, okay, I guess you could teleport behind this guy because um, maybe there's a shadow behind him. These are the kind of questions that create this lull in the action, and that's an unfortunate thing about the design of this feature. You need to be able to see where you're teleporting to, and this just makes the inability to see through our own magical darkness that much more frustrating. Still, it's teleports. Teleports are good, and it doesn't cost key, thank the gods. So, you know what, this is still a pretty good ability. Then at level 11, we get Cloak of Shadows, and if you're in dim light or darkness, you can use your action to become invisible. Pretty much like the spell, you become visible if you make an attack or cast a spell. Three things to note here. There is no concentration on this, which is nice. There is no maximum duration on this, which is really nice. And you are automatically revealed in bright light, which is awful. Now, if you're just using this to sneak around, then you could probably just avoid bright light. But if you're using this in combat, you know, someone even holding a torch means you will not be able to sneak up to attack them in melee invisibly. Or again, if there happens to be a brightly lit room where the combat occurs, you're not going to be able to use this. Still, once again, it doesn't cost key, and it's not limited in uses, so it's, it's decent overall. So the Shadow Monk gets an ability at level 3 that uses up a lot of key, and lets you some utility spells and a cantrip technically possibly some spells you can use in combat but they're very circumstantial at level 6 and level 11 we're getting fairly good features that don't use key but they have some inconvenient light limitations of the player's handbook monks this one is the least sucky but what shadow monk doesn't do is give us something really effective to do in combat we might get advantage on an attack here and there but often giving up our bonus action attack to get it Shadow Monk really almost works, and for that I give it an E rating. I think you're going to find it pretty frustrating, but it could be worse. Which reminds me, our next subclass is Way of the Astral Self. So this one was introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. From my understanding, there was a feature in the Unearthed Arcana version that scaled a bit too much for some players' tastes, so the designers took the Astral Self Monk back to the design table and beat the crap out of it. At third level, we get Arms of the Astral Self. So this is a bonus action and costs a key point. If we do it in combat, we can potentially do some damage to nearby enemies. If it's one enemy, we might have been just as good punching it. But if it's several enemies, then, you know, we could get decent value from that at low levels. The damage is two martial arts dice, 2d4, and then you get a save to avoid it, so it's not much damage. And then it has really slow scaling, just like our martial arts die. I mean, exactly like our martial arts die, because that's what it's using. So it's just going to be worse and worse against level appropriate enemies. When you are level 20, 2d10 damage, if you don't make your saving throw, is not even worth taking the time to have them roll the save. So then for 10 minutes, you can make unarmed strikes with your spectral arms. You can use your wisdom modifier instead of dexterity for unarmed strikes and do force damage with them. And your reach with the unarmed strikes increases by five feet. And you can use wisdom instead of strength for strength checks and saving throws. First off, the one key point this costs is fine. If only you got something good for it. But this feature isn't good. Let me tell you why. So you can make unarmed strikes with reach but you can't use heavy weapons, so your weapon attacks don't have reach. Now, you could just do your attack action and your bonus action attacks all on unarmed strikes, but unarmed strikes are worse. Your martial arts style is lousy, and that's what they're based on, and again, no magical weapons. Secondly, you can use your wisdom instead of your dexterity for your unarmed strikes, but same problem. Your weapon attacks still use dexterity, so if you concentrate on Wisdom, then your weapon attack rolls fall behind. If you concentrate on Dexterity, then being able to use your Wisdom for attacks really doesn't do you anything. Also, this feature is limited in use by key, so if you run out of key and you didn't concentrate on Dexterity, then all your attacks are worse. And switching the damage type to Force sounds good, but it's not. 
Your attacks were going to be magical anyways by 6th level. They probably didn't need to be magical much before then. And once they are, they're just as reliable as force damage. Except now your attacks don't even qualify for using the Crusher feat. So you've potentially made them worse. Strength saving throws almost never happen. And then there's the strength checks. Okay, so if you want to grapple, then you can actually not be terrible at it. But you're not good at it. You're not getting advantage or anything, you're just using a non-terrible ability score. So you're as good as grappling as the other average melee character that didn't focus on grappling. I guess you could grapple two people, and then do your lousy, lousy punches on them. So there's that, I guess. You know what this should do? It should give you more attacks with martial arts unarmed strikes. I mean, obviously, that's what it should do. You're running around with four arms, and you can't punch any more than you could with two arms. I mean, come on. Or maybe you should be able to grapple with them. If you could grapple with Reach, now we're talking about something interesting. Or both. But what we get here is all either worthless or tiny, tiny stuff. And it's using our key, and honestly, I don't know if it's worth that key. Then at level 6, we get Visage of the Astral Self. So this feature, first and foremost, has us spending two key to set up our astral stuff. Like, what the hell? We can't even scale our features without draining more key. So what do we get? Well, first we get the ability to see in darkness, even magical darkness, for 10 minutes. Boy, wouldn't that have been great on the Shadow Monk, who actually gets the darkness spell. Then we get advantage on insight and intimidation checks. So when I'm making an insight check, I'm seldom prepped for it by activating a feature earlier. And I'm not making intimidation checks with my monk because, you know what, they forced me to focus on three specific ability scores, so I had to dump my charisma. And then we can talk to people privately, or we can talk really loud. And that is the whole feature. Now, there are things we can do to make the Seeing in Magical Darkness decent. But there is nothing built into this subclass that allows us to do that. So we're either, you know, making a three-level multi-class dip to try to do something with that, or we're relying on other party members to do the heavy lifting. Everything else here is super minor. And they're draining more key for this. So this is a bad feature too. Basically, up to 11th level, what this subclass does is it allows you to spend two key on a bunch of little nothing abilities. And that's it. This is until 11th level. So at 11th level, when we spend that two key to have both the arms and the visage up, we can reduce damage from acid, cold, fire, force, lightning, or thunder with our reaction, and we do an extra die of damage when doing the astral arms and unarmed strikes. So this is our first good ability. So astral self monks are terrible. The features sound pretty cool, but when we look at the mechanics, they're just not doing much for us at all until level 11. So much so, I don't think these features are even worth the key they cost from levels 1 through 10. So Astral Self is an F. This subclass just doesn't work. The idea is okay, but these arms and spectral mask just aren't giving us much at all. I mean, four arms no extra attacks. What is the point of that? So Monk needs a strong subclass, and what we've got here is just a terrible subclass on the weakest chassis. Next up is the Drunken Master. Oh, I watched the movie and I wanted to like this. I really did. This one came to us in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and one thing we learn about Xanathar is apparently monks get disregarded. So, at third level, we get proficiency in the performance skill and a tool proficiency. Not the skill I would choose, but fine. Then we get Drunken Technique. This is the primary feature here. Whenever we use Flurry of Blows, which costs a key, we get a temporary 10-foot movement increase, and we're treated as having taken the disengage action. So this is bad. Let me tell you why. Who looks at the Monk class and thinks, you know, there's some challenges here, but you know what would make this work? If they were just a bit more mobile when they spend more key. Because that is what you've got here. Our flurry of blows 
isn't a great expenditure of key in the first place, and we're not making it better or giving us a nice alternative or anything, we're improving our mobility. We're already a monk. Mobility is the one thing we weren't bad at. I mean, I guess I can pop into melee, deliver some monk attacks, then pop out. At least until my key runs out. Is that much better than just shooting a short bow, though? I know, I know. Stunning strike. But if I do stunning strike and it does anything, then why did I need to disengage at all? And if I'm spending key on flurry of blows and I'm spending key on stunning strike, I'm going to run out twice as fast. Then at level 6, we get tipsy sway. We can get up from prone with 5 feet of movement. Wow, that's handy. Then we can spend a key when we are missed with a melee attack, so I guess we didn't get much use out of that disengage after all. And really, don't expect to be missed all that often. And then we can use our reaction to have that attack hit a different creature of our choice that we can see within 5 feet of us. So this is a bad feature. Let me tell you why. Okay, so let's ignore that part, getting up from prone. It is not worth talking about. So, in order for this redirected attack thing to be useful, first, we better not be out of key. I mean, let's face it, we probably are. We're a monk, and we run out of key really fast. But let's say we have key. So this is what has to happen for us to set this up. I actually have to have my monk be in harm's way. Not just from one but from multiple enemies. Let's not just go into melee, let's get ourselves surrounded. Then we get to use our key and our reaction to redirect one attack. We have one reaction and we're in melee with multiple enemies with a monk. And doesn't this combine just so great with our third level feature, which seemed to be made to avoid this very situation in the first place? I love it when subclass features actually make each other worse. Then we get Drunkard's Luck at 11th level, and when we make an ability check, attack roll, or saving throw, and have disadvantage on the roll... Okay, let's stop right there. How much do the designers think this is happening? Hey player, make a saving throw, and you have disadvantage. That DM is getting murdered, I mean like for real. Okay, but maybe you're attacking somebody who's invisible or something. So fine, that can happen. So then we spend two key points to cancel disadvantage for that roll. Oh. My. Lord. Useless. Friggin useless. So Drunken Master is awful. At least Astral Self Monk might be able to do something if someone else in the party provides magical darkness and they get something good if you get to level 11. Drunken Master has nothing going for it. It is one of the worst subclasses in the game attached to the worst class in the game. This is probably going to be the lowest score we see on this entire list. Then again, I'm thinking about another subclass of Monk right now. It might not even be the lowest today. Next up, we have the four elements. So, you think most monks have trouble with key? This one stained the pages of the player's handbook. So, at level 3, we get Disciple of Elements. This allows your monk to cast spells, or things that are kind of like spells. Here's a handy chart that shows you how much key you get to spend to upcast your spells with. Look at that! Let me give you the example they list. Our 5th level monk. 5th level. So our monk, with 5 key points total, can spend 3 key points to cast Burning Hands as a 2nd level spell. You get 2 of these spells, or spell-like abilities, at level 3, and one of them is Elemental Attunement, which is basically like a flavor cantrip. The other one could be one of several options. I'm not going to go through the list of options, but if you do choose a spell, it's going to be a 1st level spell, and it's going to cost two key points to cast it. This is absolutely terrible. I mean, the Shadow Monk gets four spells, and they're second level, and those are expensive at two key. Now, thanks to Tasha's, we can make a bonus action attack after casting, so there is that. At higher levels, we can access higher level spells, but for the most part, we're talking blasty stuff, and we're getting it way too late for it to be any good. I talked not that long ago about how blasting spells aren't scaling well. When you're a third level, a first level spell isn't very good. When you're 11th level, a third level blasting spell isn't very good. 
So, for example, you can get Fireball, but you need to be 11th level. And you know what? It costs 4 key to cast. So you could spend all your key, and you could cast a 3rd level spell twice at 11th level. But you know what? You can make a bonus action attack. So I guess that totally makes up for it. Now, here is the point where I would normally talk about the 6th and 11th level features, but we're not going to do that with the 4 Elements Monk, because they don't get any more features. They get additional spell options that cost way too much key to be worth it, and that's it. Now, you know what? I do see what they were trying to do here. We have Arcane Tricksters and Eldritch Knights that provide a little bit of spellcasting to non-spellcasting classes. And I think with four elements, they were trying to do this with Monk. But here's where they just totally screwed up. And in such a predictable way. Eldritch Knights and Arcane Tricksters get spell slots. Four elements monks do not get any resources from which to cast their spells. They must use the resource that they were already going to be using up. Could you imagine if other classes were designed this way? Like, imagine your arcane trickster. You can cast a spell, but you can't sneak attack anymore until you take a short rest. Or your Eldritch Knight can cast a spell, but you have to expend your action surge. That's basically what they did here. They provided spells, but they didn't provide the resource to cast them. So you're giving up your class resource that you needed elsewhere. This is a massive design miss. I like spells, but this is like not really a spellcaster at all. Not even like a third spellcaster like Arcane Trickster and Eldritch Knight. They are both much better spellcasters than Four Elements Monks. This is an F. But you know what? Probably still better than either the Drunken Master or Astro Self Monk. Next up, Way of the Kensai. This one was released in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. At third level, we get four features. It's really three. First, we get Kensai weapons. This allows you to get proficiency in a melee and ranged weapon, and you treat those weapons as monk weapons. Just like with a base monk, these can't have the special or heavy properties, so same problem. Then we get Agile Parry. If we use our attack action to make an unarmed strike instead of a weapon attack, and as I mentioned before, that is a bad trade-off, then you get a plus two bonus to armor class until your next turn. And get this, we don't have to spend our reaction, and it's against all attacks during that time. And we don't even have to spend a key point. So there is a sacrifice for doing this, but this is actually good. This is a good feature. Then we get Kensai's Shot, which allows us to use our bonus action to get a bonus D4 damage on a ranged weapon attack. So it's like all those subclasses that provide a bonus die of damage to a single attack. You know, except this one steals our bonus action, so it's not good. It might have been interesting if they had made it a martial arts die instead, so at least there would have been some scaling. But no, bonus action for a potential D4 of damage. You know how good that is? Look at the Spore Druid. There was a feature that I wouldn't even talk about because it's so bad. This is basically the same thing, except it's using a bonus action instead of a reaction. Then we get a tool proficiency. So, like I said, it's really three features. So overall, Agile Parry is good. Kensai Weapons was okay before All Monks got basically the same thing. I guess it does give you the proficiencies, otherwise you'd have to get them like through your race or something. And Kensai Shot basically takes a class that's bad at ranged and makes it so it's bad at range still. Then at level 6, we get one with the blade. Our Kensai weapons are treated as magical. I mean, I would hope that's not going to be a problem. I think in most campaigns, that's redundant. I do think there are some campaigns where this could be really helpful. But most of the time, I would expect it is not going to do anything for you. Then we get Death Strike, where we can spend one key to do extra damage to a target equal to our martial arts die. To anyone who thinks this is good, Go back right now, look at Hands of Harm on Mercy Monk. This is a drain of the same amount of key for less. If you are finding you have more key than you want, just flurry. It'll do more damage. Our final feature at level 11 is Sharpen the Blade. This allows you to enhance your Kensai weapon by using your key. You can spend up to 3 points and you get a bonus to attack and damage rolls equal to the amount spent for 1 minute. This would be awesome. 
except it has no effect on a magic weapon that already had a bonus to attack and damage rolls. Now, surely, I mean surely, by level 11, this is tier 3, we have a decent magical weapon. Maybe it doesn't have a bonus to attack and damage rolls. I mean, maybe it's a flame blade or something. But most magical weapons aren't going to work with this. So let's say we have a plus 2 weapon. So we can put that weapon away, then pull out a non-magic weapon, then use our bonus action and three key points to get plus three on the weapon for a minute. Now I had another video where I talked about some of the issues with DPR calculations. This particular feature is one that really skews with DPR calculations, gives you some really misleading information, because when we do these kinds of things, we assume no magical weapons. But you are level 11 you are likely rocking a great weapon and this feature likely won't work with it and so in reality it may not increase your DPR at all or at least much less than the numbers would have indicated and it's the huge drain on key. This still isn't a terrible ability like I said there are some weapons even magical weapons this can work with and then it's a pretty significant bonus so some of the time it's gonna be decent and then some of the time it's gonna be pretty bad so overall, it's, you know, okay. So we get a feature that can give us a plus two to armor class by giving up a weapon attack for an unarmed strike, which is good. And we get a bunch of other stuff. I think a lot of people like this one a lot more than I do. But you know what? Plus two armor class is a big deal. And on a monk, you really kind of need it. So I can see an E here. That brings us to Way of the Long Death. This was introduced in the Sword Coast Adventures Guide. There were actually two monk subclasses in that book, because of course there were. At level 3, you get Touch of Death. This gives you temporary hit points equal to your monk level, plus your wisdom modifier whenever you reduce a creature within 5 feet of you to 0 hit points. Now this is a good feature. It would have been a heck of a lot better on a chassis that can actually reliably down enemies. But, you know what, we could always carry around a bag of rats. You know what, on second thought, we're a monk. I'd be careful taking on a rat. I'm joking, I'm joking. Truly though, I do not expect this to be the character to be getting a lot of killing blows in combat. Martial arts die plus dexterity attacks just aren't well suited for that. At 6th level we get Hour of Reaping. This requires an action and can potentially frighten creatures within 30 feet of us for one round. This feature is almost really good, but there is one thing that actually makes it pretty bad. The duration of course is not good, but the brutal thing here is the friendly fire. 30 feet around us and we can't exclude anyone? I mean, how are we supposed to do that without catching allies? I mean, we are fast, so I guess we could rush ahead into a horde of enemies and then hope enough fail their save that we aren't absolutely vaporized waiting for the rest of the party to catch up and save us. But on the surface, this is like a mass frighten effect, which sounds really good. And this is really close to being a good ability, but it just isn't. Then at level 11, we get Mastery of Death. The feature reads that when you're reduced to zero hit points, you can expand one key point to have one hit point instead. I am so glad they said when you are reduced to zero hit points instead of if you are reduced to zero hit points, because you know what, there's some honesty there, and we should give them credit for that. But this ability is a decent ability. As they say, getting reduced to zero hit points is a matter of when, and if you're trying to use your sixth level feature, it may come soon, sooner than you think, so hopefully you have some key left, and then this is going to be pretty useful. So, long death monks get a good feature at level three. It would be better on, you know, pretty much any other class to be honest but it's still a good feature at six level we get a feature that is going to be brutal to even use it looks so good but you just can't use it and at 11th level you get a feature that is pretty useful honestly this is better than most monks but in the end since your six level feature is hard to use just what are we doing offensively stunning strike stunning strike yeah i know i know Next up is the Way of the Open Hand. This was a player's handbook monk, and is probably the most iconic monk there is. At level 3 we get Open Hand Technique. 
So this is an enhancement to our Flurry of Blows feature, which on its own isn't all that great. So like with the other features we see tied to the Flurry of Blows, you still have to use the one key point to use it. So although the key point isn't specifically tied to this, remember at level 3, this is 3 times per short rest maximum. And only if we don't use any of our other key base features. But, you know what, when we hit a creature with a Flurry of Blows attack, we can have it make a Dexterity saving throw or fall prone, or we could have it make a strength saving throw or get pushed 15 feet away from us, or we could remove its ability to take reactions. So this is not bad. It's not great, but it's not bad. The save or knock prone is probably no more reliable than any strength based melee character shoving prone. Probably less reliable actually, though we don't have the size limitations. The push effect, I just can't help but think if we took Crusher, they wouldn't get a saving throw and we could pick a direction for them. They wouldn't move as far, and again, there's size limits involved, so this still might be the way to go. And removing the reaction could be okay if they have decent reaction, or even the opportunity to use a reaction. You know, in most turns, most enemies don't use a reaction. But you know what? This is okay. Then at level 6, we get Wholeness of Body. This allows you to regain 3 times your monk level in hit points as an action once per long rest. So this is bad. Let me tell you why. 18 hit points when we get this of healing once per long rest as an action. That is not a lot of healing and that is the entire feature. One subpar healing action cost once per long rest. The fighters get a better self heal at level 1. And that one uses a bonus action and recovers on a short rest. That's how bad this is. Then at level 11, we gain the effects of a Sanctuary spell after a long rest that lasts until we make our first attack in our first combat of the day. And then it's gone, and that's it. And that's it. We get an okay ability at 3, and then not much afterwards. Bad stuff. As far as the Player's Handbook Monks goes, this is the second best. And so, it's an F. But it's a higher F for what that's worth. This brings us to our final monk subclass, and that's Way of the Sun Soul. This one is the other one that came in the Sword Coast Adventures Guide. What a treasure of great subclasses that book was. At level 3, we can use... When we take the attack action, we can make a ranged spell attack against an enemy up to 30 feet away from us, so not very far. Using our dexterity to attack and damage, and the damage die is our martial arts die. So if we use this, we can attack at range with Dexterity, and if we hit, we do a D4 plus our Dexterity modifier and damage. And you know what? If we were just to use a short bow, which we're proficient in anyway, we can increase the range and the damage. So this feature is worse than what we already have built in. But if you use this, you can spend key to attack twice more as a bonus action, so it's like flurry of blows at range. But this is forcing unarmed strikes for action and bonus action all over again. It's like force damage unarmed strikes from Astral Monk all over again too, because no crusher feed, etc. This feature is awful. It's like attacking unarmed instead of with a weapon, except we can't even use stunning strike. But we can do it with a short amount of range. Oh, and no martial arts attack either. That's all we get at level 3. Something that's not just bad, it's actually a trap. Then at level 6 we get Searing Arc Strike. After we take the attack action, we can use our bonus action and two friggin' key to cast Burning Hands as a first level spell. It's Four Elements Monk all over again, except the Four Elements Monk is using their bonus action to attack and their action to cast. Otherwise, basically the same, except you know what? The Four Elements Monk got to choose between many different options, and Burning Hands was probably not what they were going to pick. Oh, and the Four Elements Monk could do this at level 3. And yes, I am now referring to the Four Elements Monk as the good example here. That's how bad this is. Listen, a first level Burning Hands at level 6 is not good. It's definitely not two key points good. And then they have the audacity to give us the option to spend more key points to upcast it. How dare you, sir? This is terrible. 
Just punch with your bonus action. Keep your key. Then at level 11, we get Searing Sunburst. And this is a little like Fireball. Well, not really Fireball. It does a quarter of the damage of Fireball at level 11. But if we spend three key points, then it does Fireball damage. Way of the Sun Soul was the perfect way to end. This is the worst monk in the game. And that is saying a lot. This is also the worst subclass in the game. Spoiler alert, nothing will ever be rated lower than the Sun Soul Monk on this list. This is like taking a Four Elements Monk, except only with Burning Hands at level 6 and Fireball at level 11, except we can also throw away our short bow and make even worse ranged attacks. Literally the worst subclass in D&D. So here is the monk. And yeah, I know, I know, Tasha's did make monks better. But you know what? Tasha's made every class better. And it wasn't kinder to monks than any of the other classes. So the bar got higher, and the monk didn't get any closer. Now, Mercy Monk did make monk better, because we actually have a monk you can make and not be lousy. And I am really so glad for that. Because I wanted to play a monk and not feel useless, and Mercy Monk allowed me to do that. But Monk is still the weakest class in the game, and by a fair bit. And the spread here shows my opinions there. But you know what? Look at this. I can make a better Monk than the worst fighters and barbarians and artificers. So that is something. So here is our final list. We really filled out some of those bottom tiers today, unfortunately. So next week we have... let me check my notes. Well, that's going from one side to another. We're doing Paladins. I don't think we'll be seeing many Fs next week. So, I hope you'll join me for that. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon.